Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be going through three different resources for DMs, GMs in their world building process, in their adventure design process, whatever it might be. The first one of these that I'm going to look at is the Sandbox Generator by Atelier Clandestine. The second one I'm going to be doing is Dungeon Guide, a Gentle's Dungeon Guide. This is by Taylor Seeley Wright. This is for the Shadow Dark system, but you could use it for any game, really, even 5e. But it's, you know, it's designed for the OSR mindset, dungeon crawl mindset. And then finally, I'm going to be looking at Maze Rats by Questing Beast, Ben Milton over at Questing Beast. These are three just absolutely fantastic resources for anybody. You know, often we as GMs have our own prep methods, right? But sometimes that can get stale. Sometimes we can just get kind of lost in it. Or maybe we don't really have a really good method and what we're doing right now is not working so well. If any of that's true, then, then these are going to be great resources for you. And even if you do have a method, the random tables in at least the first and third of these books are excellent. And the second book, Dungeon Guide, Gentle's Dungeon Guide, is pay what you want. So you can pick it up for free, check it out, see if you like it. And if you do, then you can you know, throw them some a couple dollars or something like that. Let's start off by looking through the sandbox generator, the first of these. This is a great product. It grows on you. The The art is pretty simplistic. Uh, it's very clearly just like, you know, um, it looks a little amateurish to start. You're like, okay, this looks like it's kind of thrown together. <laughs> and um, it's $12 on DriveThruRPG, which seems like a lot for kind of this, this sort of presentation. But what you get in this book is absolutely excellent. Really, really, really great tables great processes for developing your own adventures. So, you know, don't let the maybe what looks like maybe a free document at first, <laughs> what looks like should be a free document at first, given the, the kind of style of the font and the design of the page and things like that. Don't let it fool you. This is a really good, really good document. So you have the introduction, talks about how you use this generator and uh, good advice in a generator. Don't feel the need to stick with what you rolled. Right? That's always, always the case. Um, what I find is that I'll roll something and I won't like it, and then I'll roll again and I'll roll again until I get the thing that I actually want, <laughs> which is silly. Uh, you can just pick the thing that you want, right? Um, so you have what a hex map is, and he suggests a two mile hex map, basically. Um, you have the different biomes and uh, how to generate a basic hex grid, what the process is for developing a basic hex map with grassland, forest, hills, marsh, mountains. Um, now, what you're, you're gonna see is that you're very likely you're, uh, very likely to get the same as the previous hex. So if you happen to roll up a mountains first or something like that, you're very likely to get a very mountainous area. Or if you happen to roll marsh first, you're gonna get a very marshy area. That's kind of cool. It, it kind of has a, um, a very similar vibe across the entire map with some variation. So if you wanna start with grasslands, you can just start with grasslands or forests, and then you can build from there. And you're going to get one or two odd men out, so to speak. But you'll pretty much, you're most likely to get kind of a, a similar thing. But you're also more likely to kind of get regions rather than like individual specs on the map. So you're not going to get like a marsh up there and a marsh down here. You're more likely to get a couple marshes or two or three marshes up in the corner or something like that. I like that too. That tends to group together. It creates more distinctive areas on the map for your players to discover. So here's how you do it. You kind of just spread out, spread out. And um, the recommendation is that you link these together rather than just build up uh, a bunch of a really, really, really big one that you build a couple regions and then link them together. Um, there's a recommendation for stopping at 19 hexes. But you could keep going as much as you wanted. This is an indefinite process of expansion. There's some encounter tables if you want. Um, there's no stats given for any of these creatures in this book. It's system neutral but it just assumes you know you, you have stats for these sorts of creatures in your world in your in your game of choice then you get how to fill out those those biomes you now have features and you have the starting hex and what you should put in them and you have um, you know you start off with uh, generally a settlement or something like that in the first hex and then you roll for each one past that as so a landmarks are the most common things you're going to roll and then settlements layers and dungeons are each equally likely now, if you roll a settlement, you have six kinds of settlements. Hamlets, villages, cities, castles, towers, or abbeys. And then the legend vote down below for how to mark them up if you're doing it by hand or something. Then there's rules for how to develop factions. It's really cool and how to show you where their areas of influence are. If you're doing a hex crawl, this is awesome. Even if you're just doing like kind of a, a world building exercise, this is a great tool. Um, 
if you're actually building a world that's not intended to be a hex crawl, it can still be helpful because you can see where people are influencing and where you know where the the uh, areas of influence are. Um, you have domains and the different kinds of domains, layers, and what they are, and then you have the relationships between the uh, the different factions that could possibly be be there. An event, if there is an event, if you've rolled an event there, and the kind of event that it is, an assassination, maybe a holy quest, a mysterious ally. Etc. Um, then you have some rules for random encounters and how to how to do that and what kind of random encounters you could have in a in a wilderness hex. And then you have an example of the biomes, the locations on top of it, and then the faction power read zones in the bottom right. Then you get the landmarks because one through three on the d6 were landmarks, and so there's different kinds of landmarks. There's natural landmarks, artificial landmarks, and magical landmarks. And then you roll all of those landmarks. You generate the nature of all of them. Then you can, all, you can also do it during the play, but then you can roll to see what actually is in that landmark. Is it a hazard? Is it empty? Is it special? Or are there monsters? So there's going to be a landmark, and then there might be something happening. There might be a landmark with a hazard as well, or it might be a landmark and just a landmark, or it might be a landmark with a special encounter, or there might be monsters layering there. Um, so you have natural landmarks, fauna, geological, A and B, veget vegetal, A and B, and then water. Artificial landmarks, labor, mysterious, religion, ruin, small structure, and travel. Magic landmarks, area under a spell, enchanted item, etc., etc. Then you have the content. So if it has a hazard, you have that there. Now, if it's empty, it's still not a useless hex. There perhaps are information, there's information you can get there. And I like that idea that there shouldn't just be a useless, empty hex that maybe has a landmark and nothing else. I like the idea that there's something there and a reason to go there. Then there's special. Something special is happening there. What could be happening? You have tables to roll to see what's going on with examples. And then you get settlements. You get monsters, obviously, uh, elsewhere. Um, you can use monsters from your system of choice. Settlements, uh, hamlets, villages, and cities. And then you have castles, towers, and abbeys. You get how to name your settlements and the kinds of buildings you might have there, as well as structures. And you can we'll see later the kinds of structures that you'll get from a town and and the uh, the how to name your town so there's variations b a b's a b's a e a right so there's different ways of naming your your town there and here are some of the nouns first name titles city names adjectives colors settlement types directions and nature names. so you can combine them all to create your own very interesting names um, and you get hamlets and there's three different layouts for those hamlets as well as the disposition of the people there, and a secret perhaps in that hamlet. It's only a one in six chance that there's a secret there, but there might be. And then there's an example hamlet. Then you get villages. Again, descriptions of the size, the occupations, and the layout that it might have, and general points of interest, special locations, the defense, and disposition, as well as people, secrets, and events, and an example. Then you get cities, and once again, it kind of builds up each time. So you have size, main occupants, or occupations, characteristics, appearance, again, etc. It goes through the whole thing. You can roll up each of these really, really in detail if you wanted to. Um, how the defense works there, the notable NPCs, the ruler, the disposition, the events, and a big example of this city. But you see, using all of these tables, you'll come up with a, a city of just a few paragraphs. It'll be up to you to fill out the rest, but it's a great place to start. Then you have castles general condition of the castles, what the keep is like, what the defense is like, the disposition of the people there, and the events that are happening there. And an example. Towers, and the same idea here. What the levels are used for. I really like this, what the levels are used for. You, you should kind of have like going up and down, right? Because it's going to be a wizard's tower, most likely. So the different levels are going to have distinct uses. What the top level and the bottom levels are like, and what the underground levels are like. As well as an example. Level 9 wizard lives and conducts experiments in this tower. They are followed by a level 2 apprentice. The tower is round and made of limestone. It is equipped with battlements. The inside is dark. Seven levels in total, connected by stairs. Then you have abbeys. What's going on at those? Have the saints of that abbey. The size of the abbey, the monks or nuns, structure and land core uh, locations in the abbey, and then additional locations within the abbey, potentially. The activities there, fame there, relic types, events, history. You can see that this book is very detailed. And it goes through the same thing with layers. Remember, that was a different category in the forest. This is where particular monsters might live. And you go through the details of how the layers are laid out, uh, the percentages of where the creatures that lair there are. So if it's a one-room dungeon, 100% of the creatures live there. Right? 
But if it's that four room structure, you might have 10% in the first room and then 20% in the other two and then 50 in the last room. So cool ways of breaking down where your monsters are. And also where the treasures are. It's sort of divided the same way. And then you have dungeons. And I really like the way dungeons are laid out here. Essentially, you have a potential number of dungeons in the area and then they have potential connections beneath them. So you might have an individual dungeon that isn't connected to the other dungeons in the region. But you might find that if you have a 6th level dungeon, level 4 actually connects to level 2 or to the 4th level of a different dungeon elsewhere, or something like that, or the 2nd level of a dungeon elsewhere. And you have to then find out how those are connected, but it's really cool to do that, I think, to find out that you go down in one dungeon in one hex, and you find an exit in another hex. That's a really cool idea. Uh, optional names for your dungeons and themes, which are always a good idea. Levels and links, rooms, and the levels and the factions that might be at play in that level, as well as potential creatures that are there in each level, wandering monsters, and how to do different uh, random encounters for your based on the factions within the dungeon, and the relationships between them, layers. I mean, again, I could go on and on. You get the idea. Structures of your dungeon. I'm going to click through a lot of these special rooms. Each of these is detailed in a paragraph or two. So you have advanced technology, animated furniture, amplified magic room, etc. It goes through the whole thing. <laughs> Every room, special room in the dungeon gets a write-up. And then you have an example of the dungeon. And here's what I mean by the structure. So you can see the levels as they're laid out. So the first dungeon in the region is six levels deep. The second dungeon has two levels and it's down at the fifth and sixth level. Um, and it might be connected, for example, to the ones that are next to it. Um, but perhaps not. And then three has those, four, five, and then five has just a gap where you can't really get to the ones below, it seems like. Yeah, here is how he's uh, drawn it up. So here is the connections between the dungeons. So as you can see, dungeon, <coughs> excuse me, dungeon one has 28 rooms. Level on the first level. The second level is 45 rooms. The third level is 22 rooms. The fourth uh, fourth level has 17. The fifth level has 30, and it also connects to the, I guess it would be first level of Dungeon 2, which has 31 rooms. And so you can see, you can create this sort of linked structure of dungeons so that they all have, I mean, I think this is awesome. Really, really cool. A great, great idea. And an example dungeon you're given. And then generators. These are just general generators. Coats of arms generators and how to do that. Criminal organization generators and how to do that. Dragon generators, if you're interested in creating very special dragons, which you should be interested in in a game called Dungeons and Dragons for the most part. <laughs> Although most of us really these days aren't playing Dungeons and Dragons, right? Uh, guilds, random guilds you can develop. Houses that you have pre-made ones with random tables for inside if you want to search them and loot them. NPC generators, great NPC generators. Tavern generators. Uh, with everything from the foods that you're eating to the sign on the door. Wizard generators, if you need a specific guy. And then adventures at sea. Short chapters for developing islands and island chains and things like that. And encounters there. A little picture of memory. Here's a worksheet for the uh, dungeon design. And then you get abbreviations used and where to find this, along with some links and things like that. Highly, highly recommend. Now, as I said, it's $12, which sounds like a lot. And I mean, a lot in one way, right? A lot of documents we can find online are free. A lot of the stuff I've been going through is free. So 12 sounds like a lot, given that a lot of the other documents I've been talking about are free. But I think this is worth it. I think it's really worth it. It's a great document. If you can find it on sale, go for it, you know? Um, but I think that's actually when I got it. I got it on sale. It was like 25% off or something like that. Um, but even I think at $12, it's totally worth it because you get just so much resource, so many resources. And I've had so much fun just playing with this. Like even when I'm not making it for an actual campaign or adventure, I've had fun just developing a hex uh, in a region and filling out the dungeons and finding out what the cities are like and finding out what the monsters are like and the special stuff going on and then connecting it. Like it's just been a ton of fun for me. And I, I really highly credit this book with, with a lot of that fun. So highly recommend the Sandbox Generator. Now, the second of these, as I mentioned, is Gentle's Dungeon Guide. This is by Taylor Seeley Wright over... You can get it at DriveThruRPG, and it's pay what you want. Now, this document is much shorter. It's only 21 pages. But I love how it's laid out. It's made to look like an old Nintendo game or something like that. And it is... Uh, essentially, this, this skull, Gentle, is talking to you and giving you advice about how to design dungeons. It's really good advice as you go through. And a lot of random tables for how to design it. So site history tables, original purpose of the site tables, 
cause of the fall of the original site tables and the present purpose that it's used for. So you can roll on these tables and get a brief idea of what this dungeon was and what's currently being used for. That's really cool. Factions, and, you know, advice about how to do this. Make three factions for your dungeon. Interesting dungeons are filled with factions. Impulses and weaknesses. So what is this? What is the faction impulse? What is the faction goal? And what is the faction weakness, right? And then flesh it out. Okay, so rewrite or return to the dungeon history and figure out how these factions fit in with that dungeon history that you've developed. Now, this booklet is designed for Shadow Dark. And so there, are, there tends to be advice based around Shadow Dark. So for example, it says, the tip here is focus on emotions. Shadow Dark lends to tragic themes, explores struggles between love and duty, seeking revenge with tragic consequences, suffering of the commons, fear of death and loss, resisting change with tragic consequences, wallowing despair, or guilt from mistakes, denial, and madness. Sure. I don't know if that's necessarily the case for every Shadow Dark game, but it can certainly do that sort of thing. This sort of advice is less my favorite, but it, it fits with the rest of the design. And again, you, you could ignore it totally and just use the tables and the ideas here. Um, then there's some sample factions. Uh, and then the dungeon itself. So this uses Sursa Victory's cyclic dungeon generation method, which I've talked about in another video. You can check that out. There's a link to it here. But there's really brief ideas for how to do a small dungeon, a regular dungeon, or a dangerous dungeon, right? And, and one session, two to three sessions, or six to ten sessions. Kind of an, an interesting guideline there. Um, the danger level, which comes from Shadow Dark, and then the entrance and how that works. Tables for that. And then room layout and advice for how to do room layouts. Basically, die, uh, die drop tables, right? Um, you drop them onto a page. And you look at where they are, and you look at the numbers on them, and you try to, if they're, if they're touching, it's a bigger room, and you just you know draw things between them and connect them that way. And then there's a room table below and a clue table if you, uh, if you want to, well, it said, he says, uh, you know, create nine facts, create three facts, and then create three facts. So one, nine facts related to dungeon history, three for factions, and then three, they're tactically useful. And then, you know, spill those in around the dungeon. Great idea. Distribute the clues throughout the dungeon. Here's an example layout and what things might look like. Uh, and then the room contents. You have hallway dressing, intersection dressing, content checklist, right? So make sure you have stuff in the dungeon. Um, at least, uh, check out the ones that do encounter, or that do happen in the dungeon. You want to make sure you find a lot of this stuff. You don't want a boring, very, very samey dungeon throughout. Iconic moments, great advice, right? Everyone has, remember everyone remember those, those iconic moments. In the Lost Citadel, the Scarlet Minotaur, the Minotaur stalking everybody. In the Red Hand of Doom, the assault on Drellin's Ferry. And encountering Strahd's illusion at his organ in the Curse of Strahd. Great, iconic moments. Everyone remembers some. Add them into your dungeon. Maybe that's an iconic moment in combat. Maybe it's not. But if it's an iconic moment in combat, here is a table for how to generate what the players are trying to do in that iconic moment. And how, you know, a way to make it iconic. Start the generators. Assassinate. VIP escort, King of the Hill, right? <laughs> Different cool ideas for making this one combat very memorable. And then there's this idea of revision, revising the dungeon, adding multiple entrances, elevation shifts, mythic entrances, um, skipping levels, doing sub levels, isolated levels, nested dungeons, all of this stuff, right? Revise it. So after you've done all this, go back over it the way that you, you know, the way that you, you do with a term paper or something <laughs> from high school. Um, go back over it and revise. And then there's an example dungeon, the very bad, the Bleeding Halls of the Puppet God, which is basic, straightforward dungeon here, but uses all of the stuff, the advice that's been given in this book, with finally the credits on the last page. So a great little document, definitely much smaller, much more focused than the sandbox generator, but I think really good too, and it's free. So again, or pay what you want. I'd recommend you know throwing a dollar or two, but it's uh, at the very least, because it's great stuff. And I love the presentation alone. That's <laughs> it's nostalgia for me, the old Nintendo vibe. It actually reminds me a lot of Vermis, that new book that's coming out, or the, the series that's coming out, Vermis 1 and 2. It reminds me of that, and I think you could kind of keep those together and maybe do something really interesting with that combination. You have certainly a vibe going during your prep. Now, the last one I wanted to cover, as I said before, is Maze Rats. Maze Rats is a game, but it's also a ton of resources here. This is by Questing Beast, and it's just, it's just a master class in terms of design, I think. At least the design of a, of a booklet and a supplement. It's only 24 pages, or if you have the spread form like I have here, uh, just 12 pages. 
but it has so much in there. Here's the basic rules for the game. You have it all right here. <laughs> how, how you do danger rules, how you do advantage and disadvantage, how you do reactions, combat, morale, healing, encumbrance, leveling up, and like everything is right there in the base game. You have character creation and how to do it for this game. But one of the things that this, this, these pages show you, and this is why the book is so good, is just the random tables. So you have random starting items or random gear tables. That's, now these are all D66 tables. You have appearance tables, physical details, backgrounds, clothing, personality, mannerisms. Great for creating NPCs or PCs. There's going to be more of this later in the NPC section. Magic and how to generate spells and the names of spells, along with mutation tables, insanity tables, and omen magical catastrophe tables. This is great. You have physical effects, physical elements, and physical forms. Ethereal effects, ethereal elements, ethereal forms. You roll uh, a d6 to see which column on the left you should use, and then you roll another d6 to see what the combination of effects, elements, and forms is that you're going to use. So if you roll a four, you go to the right column, and then you roll another four, you roll if you, you take a physical effect and an ethereal element. So then you roll 2d6 on the physical elements, and you get a three and a five, which would take, give you to wood. And then you got ethereal element. Um, oh, sorry, the physical effects, right? Physical effect. I <laughs> did physical element. Physical effects. So three, five would be illuminating. And then you got, an, uh, say, a two and a one. That would be ectoplasm. So illuminating ectoplasm. That's the name of your spell. That's a great idea. I really like that. Monsters and animals. Again, tables for these aerial animals, terrestrial animals, aquatic animals, monster features, monster traits, monster abilities, monster tactics, monster personality, and monster weaknesses. 2d6 tables for all of these. And then characters. Civilized NPCs, underworld NPCs, wilderness NPCs, female names, male names, upper class surnames, lower class surnames, assets, liabilities, goals, misfortunes, missions. This I have used this page so much in my character creation. My NPC generation, when I'm making when I'm doing anything in a world, I just use this. It's up at the very least. This would be awesome to just print out and have in your screen, honestly. The players need to come up with a quick... Uh, they run into a random NPC you haven't prepared. Give them you know, a minute and a half, and you have a fully fleshed out NPC with everything. And here's more, if you need them to have more methods that they use, appearances that they might have, physical details, clothing, personality, mannerisms, secrets, reputations, hobbies, and relationships, divine domains, and after the party. Which is a little bit more different. The Divine Domains and the After the Party, right, are extra tables that are added into what might be... Um, the rest of these are more about your NPCs. Treasure and Equipment Tables. Items, weapons, miscellaneous book item subjects. Uh, tool items, potions, magical ingredients, treasure, treasure, and valuable materials. Super cool as a brief rundown. The City and how to develop a city with themes, events, district themes, upper class buildings, low class buildings, just absolutely fantastic tables here. The wild, absolutely great ideas for the wilderness and how to develop regions there along with some inns and how to develop in adjectives, nouns, and a quirk because every inn should be interesting. The maze, which is the dungeon and some dungeon generation tables. The form, the layout, ruinations, rewards. You could combine this with both of the previous documents very easily. And then a uh, Game Master's Guide with some prep and running the game advice, which is great. How to build the world, and then a thank you page. That is it. 12 pages, or 24 if you have a single page open at a time. An absolutely fantastic document. Maze Rats is so, so good. Now the print version is, uh, it used to be pay what you want. I think it's now $5 on drive through RPG. If you are backing Nave, then there is an option to get the Maze Rats um, Maze Nave 2, I should say, which is uh, Ben's newest game coming out. If you've kickstarted that, or if you pre-order it or do a late back, I think you can still do either late backing or pre-ordering. I'm not sure, but one of the others open. You can get the Maze Rats, this booklet, in print. Um, otherwise, you can just get it on, on PDF form, and you can print it out yourself. It's fairly straightforward if you know how to do the you know, booklet printing. So I highly recommend all three of these documents. Maze Rats... Gentle's Dungeon Guide, and the Sandbox Generator. All three are great tools to use in your game prep and have helped me immensely in mine. I hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.